Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcella Schaefer, and as one of the managing editors of the NYU Law Review, I have the pleasure of welcoming all, all of you to Law Review Symposium on Data Law in a Global Digital Economy. As part of our aim of publishing scholarship that shaped the rule of law, the Law Review is always seeking innovative ideas that boldly address the challenges we face today. While there are many challenges we face today, the debate around how law does, should, or can affect data ownership, concentration, and control often makes the front page news. From the GR GDPR taking effect earlier this year to Cambridge Analytica's use of Facebook data. We couldn't be more thrilled to be co-hosting a symposium with the Greeny Institute of Global Legal Studies and the Institute for International Law and Justice that helps further our aim of elevating ideas and arguments that impact the law and society. Today's symposium on data law in a global digital economy brings together experts from a diversity of backgrounds, experiences, and approaches to thinking about data law, a subject that's underexplored. We on the Law Review are so fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with one of those experts, Professor Benedict Kingsbury, who is the faculty advisor of this symposium. I want to take a minute to thank him, as well as Thomas Strines and Angelina Fisher, for their generous support, guidance, and enthusiasm for putting all of this together. The digital economy and the use of data raise fundamental questions about their legal regulation, and I invite everyone here to think deeply and critically about these issues and to engage with our panelists in exploring some possible answers today. I'll now turn it over to Professor Kingsbury and Thomas. Thank you all for coming today, and I hope you enjoy the symposium. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Benedict Kingsbury, Vice Dean of the Law School for Global and International Matters. So on behalf of our Dean, Trevor Morrison, and my faculty colleagues, many of whom are here on the program, and our various centers who are involved in this space, and a terrific group of students, including the Law Review, who it's a pleasure working with them, Half of all of us, I'd like to welcome those who are coming from out of the law school to the conference and, uh, uh, and express the excitement that we feel as this thing really begins to rev up. So the, the whole area of law and tech is something which is becoming important now in NYU Law School. We have uh, 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 this month three conferences in a sort of structured sequence. This is the first of them. The, uh, Next, two of them, uh, one is next week, um, organized by the Engelberg Center, um, and uh, together with the Information Law Institute, we are two very strong established groups of faculty uh, in this space um, on trade secrets and algorithmic systems. Um, and in the very end of November, first day of December, our Center for Civil Justice is organizing a conference on artificial intelligence. Uh, with, um, it kind of focuses on its relationship to democracy and rule of law. It's the, the big picture of it and uh, also an element of specific uh, work on the implications for uh, civil courts, civil trials, case management, the, uh, things of that space of AI. That field of AI is uh, de developed strongly in NYU as a whole by the uh, AI Now Institute, which touches on all the schools, including a very active component in the law school. The law school also people, has people working on digital data AI questions in relation to policing, uh, criminal justice, human rights, uh, fintech kind of things, uh, uh, quite uh, energetic work on uh, racial justice and, uh, uh, and, and really almost all over the school. And we now bring that together uh, and th th this is one of the many forays into that. So that is the big picture. Uh, the specific uh, kind of drivers for this um, conference come especially from the international law, global governance side. That's the little part of this that we hope to be adding from that side of NYU Law School's work. So the uh, two institutes involved in this, uh, the Institute for International Law and Justice, which has been here since 2002 and carries on a prior senator of Tom Franks, uh, that's been uh, very active in uh, trying to uh, understand and perhaps construct law for global governance, uh, uh, initially global administrative law, which has become a well-established field now. Uh, in, in the last few years, we've worked a lot on what we call mega regulation. We have a book in the press at the moment about uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, uh, other projects of mega regulation, including Belt and Road. 
Uh, and uh, we, we've worked on indicators, uh, rankings, organizations of data, governance by information as forms of power. Uh, most recently, we've started a project on infrastructure uh, with the tagline infrastructure as regulation. We had the inaugural conference uh, on that, for that a few weeks ago. And the idea is that uh, physical infrastructure of the traditional sorts and digital infrastructure both have some interesting common characteristics, uh, including their capacity to regulate, to, to create possibilities, uh, to channel them, to cut them off, uh, to be, have distributive effects, have things built on them, uh, to be raised issues of maintenance, uh, decay, uh, layering, repurposing. So we're trying to study the digital and the physical infrastructures together, and that's part of the animation then for this uh, eventual work on data from that side. Uh, our new enterprise, uh, only uh, founded um, this year, the Guarani Institute for Global Legal Studies, uh, really has the uh, multi-dimensional elements of some moving forward NYU's very long-standing uh, global legal work. Uh, we have a very big law abroad program, nearly 50 JD students spending a semester abroad uh, under it, uh, and of course the long-standing program of bringing the outstanding scholars here, the Hauser program. Uh, the Guarini Institute, though, has uh, developed one kind of large new program trying to respond to the importance of tech, uh, digital tech, other kinds of tech, uh, and data issues in the world, uh, and that's the one uh, which is directly responsible for the conference today here, the Guarini Global Law and Tech Enterprise, uh, and uh, uh, Thomas Strines is the executive director of that, and Angelina Fisher is the program and policy director. Uh, Thomas and Angelina have worked together on this conference, especially it's formed Thomas to do a lot of the planning and uh, intellectual inspiration, as well as uh, the logistics, and I'm profoundly grateful to him and uh, Angelina, and to our terrific administrator, Rachel Jones, uh, who's done a ton with the logistics, uh, and several good graduate students uh, that we have, including uh, Lauren. Burke and uh, Hashido Butnaga who are working on these. So th thanks to all of them, and that's how we come to be here. So the, the, um, uh, the, the overall direction that we want to take just in framing a little bit this morning is mainly going to be uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, we're kind of working on a joint paper framing this, um, and th th these are the things we're going to go through. I won't elaborate now because we're about to say the same things. Anyway, uh, th th uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious uh, that Data has become a central part of the global economy and obviously the global digital economy by nature. Uh, that we, we teach a course on global uh, digital corporations. Uh, we've done that now for uh, several years. And uh, uh, primarily Silicon Valley uh, ones and also ones headquartered in China, uh, some others. Uh, th there are of course numerous startups, mid scale uh, new economy businesses, uh, increasingly engaging in and pushing for different kinds of transnational regulation as well as national and self-regulation. Uh, cloud computing, uh, of course, is transformative for almost every kind of business and raises immense jurisdictional issues that only works with strong data flow. And the question is what secures that. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, depend also on, hugely on data, availability of data, the belief there might be even competition about accumulations of data. Uh, but the old economy depends also increasingly on data. The work on, we've done on TPP is really heavily about uh, value chains, uh, supply chain structures, also service delivery, all of which depends on data flows. And TPP is the first international instrument to have a chapter on global data law, in effect, global digital law. Um, so Thomas will come to that. Um, the attention economy, the whole ad structures, uh, are well known, it's, it's, it's created this category really of uh, in response of personal data uh, and uh, the way in which law Im imposes categories on the field of data science, and, but often imposes them inconsistently uh, amongst different jurisdictions, uh, some misframings. Uh, that's becoming one of our themes, I think, as we explore this field. So uh, I think it's pretty clear that the question of valuation of data uh, remains uh, very un undeveloped and very uneven and also in its legal uh, uh, expressions. And the whole question of the significance of concentrations of data, the, the techniques for concentrating it or for breaking up those concentrations, access to data uh, that, uh, has, has become central and the securing of public benefits in a way that hasn't yet been well organized. Some of those themes we're hoping to bring out today. So uh, we, we, we have here in, in, in proposing this conference, uh, the beginning of what might become uh, a program to see if we can explore, perhaps uh, begin to articulate a field of data law, and in particular from our interest, uh, global data law. So, uh, but it's very much exploratory. 
well, it's obviously a law of the horse kind of question. Is, is this useful? Uh, it is, or is it actually distorting? Uh, our intuition is there's enough possibilities here that it's worth exploring. And this conference tries to do that sort of from foundational elements. Uh, the, uh, I think it's pretty clear that, that, that there are some things about digital data which may be somewhat different from uh, other uh, categories in the world. Uh, if we think of the comparison with capital, for example, the organization of capital flows transnationally has been one of the central activities of liberal capitalist uh, international global law. Uh, data, of course, is intangible largely, but it has physical storage. Um, and, and easily transferable in the same way as capital probably is. Uh, it increases hugely in value with aggregation, we think, and there are incentives to standardization, and we can see some parallels with the capital markets, uh, derivatives, et cetera, there, but perhaps it's even more. It's historical at exceedingly low cost, uh, becoming more true, that is. And of course, unlike capital, it's replicable, replicable at almost no cost. So th those characteristics of data pretty clearly pose some special regulatory problems, especially when we reach beyond the single state. Uh, and th 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 that's what, what drives us to think there might be something to study here. So our uh, kind of intuition about this has been, well, there are lots of established legal categories with very sophisticated work, uh, often bodies of knowledge and thinking built up over, over centuries or decades. Um, and the question we want to explore with this conference, without at all prejudging it, um, is whether uh, refracting the insights, the illumination shed by those established legal fields, refracting them through a, a, a prism or a lens uh, and focusing them on data, whether that produces any different insights, especially as they're woven together. And uh, we, we, we hope it might, uh, the law review hopes it might, um, but we're uh, uh, agnostic, it's, it's, it's a speculation rather than something we feel confident about yet. Our plan is to have a, a large, Global Data Law Conference uh, in April, April 26th and 27th, two days, it might even have to go more with some legal theory parts, but with people from lots of parts of the world and uh, see if we can build another step on this. But the uh, design of this conference was really to focus on much more foundational legal work and thinking, very established work and see how it seems to work out in relation to data. So those established legal concepts and technologies which will come up in the day, uh, the, the, the last panel is about uh, property, uh, ideas of property, whether they should or shouldn't apply to data and how they, they work. The one before that on contracts. Uh, we also have several faculty working on torts issues. Uh, we, we have, uh, right after this, uh, a panel on uh, trusts, fiduciary kind of uh, uh, questions um, and, and what difference those could make, uh, data trusts, uh, et cetera, data sharing. Uh, we have, of course, the standard regulatory uh, packages of self-governance by particular companies, self-governance across parts of industry, uh, multi-stakeholder governance, all the usual things. The, the drivers to set standards, which are endemic and global regulatory governance in general, but have to be very fast in the data and IT kind of space. Uh, and there's always these questions of capture, dominance, uh, the, uh, the distributional effects of speed, uh, and the enforcement mechanisms, exclusions, uh, and of course the antitrust implications of that. Uh, the, the whole body of law and market regulation, uh, we have some, uh, some of our tax faculty interested in this, the enormous amount of work on privacy, and a whole group of experts at our faculty on that, and, and antitrust, which will be a part of a panel here today with standard setting. Uh, and, and from our own international lawyer sort of standpoint, these pretty important questions of, of how private international law works, multi-jurisdictional regulation of data, uh, and often it's rather incomplete. Uh, there's a wonderful conference next week here on whether, on the it's called The Continuing Relevance of Private International Law uh, by a whole bunch of experts in that field. Uh, but also public international law um, it, 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 uh, it raises a, it is, is invoked often in relation to the trade and investment questions, uh, also cyber security, national security kind of concerns. Uh, and uh, our own uh, clinic uh, and uh, externship programs that Angelina Fisher runs place students with international organizations, all of whom are struggling to develop data policies and their interface with private sector operators, et cetera. So we're heavily working on that. It's part of our longstanding involvement with IOs. Uh, and the whole enterprise could be framed as a transnational governance field, or transnational regulatory governance, uh, and of course there's a significant demand for that for which uh, there's not yet very much supply, and we're exploring how those two might come together. So uh, assumption is that law makes a difference in this space. Of course, it's heavily driven by business and technology, uh, but that legal characterizations shape how data is understood, how and where it's accumulated, uh, the storage methods, the movement and flows, and blockages of flows, 
uh, the, the terms of uh, use, uh, access, uh, perhaps destruction. We don't find much destruction of data, probably in practice, but in theory. Um, so, so, so that's uh, how we set this up. And uh, I now turn over to Thomas Strange to say a little more about some specific elements. Thank you, Benedict, and thank you everyone for being here this uh, morning. In the re remaining 10 or 15 minutes in the session, I just want to sketch out some elements of this merging field of global data law that um, Benedict was talking about. And our starting point is that law makes a difference, not just in, in terms of ordering the relationships between the different actors uh, involved in the global digital economy, but also conceptually in categorizing data in certain ways. So as Benedict mentioned, privacy law relies heavily on, on the category of personal data and, and isn't that much concerned about non-personal data, which leaves that space of uh, non-personal data that is quite relevant for various digital economy applications such as self-driving cars to be regulated in different ways. And uh, the panel this afternoon um, with the paper by Florence Marta Wurgler and Kevin Davis will talk a bit about um, the difference between uh, regulation of data by public law type privacy regulation and regulation by contractual governance. And in similar ways, we can see the interactions between privacy law and, and intellectual property law where um, the question who owns data turns out to be surprisingly difficult to answer as we saw in the recent controversies in uh, Toronto about uh, Google's sidewalk lab project to create a smart city which raises the question who would, would get access and control to that data. And Lisa Austin's uh, paper will talk about uh, trust-like concepts of, of safe sharing sites as one possible solution for that. So why are we interested in uh, these categorizations from an international law and, law and global governance perspective? And the reason is that what we see as international law that is relevant in this space and what we've analyzed as global governance type institutions that structure some of the background infrastructure but also a lot of the day-to-day -day operations in, in cloud computing interacts with these established legal categories and with the different legal technologies of regulating data. And it, analyzing this interaction really necessitates uh, coming together in a synthesizing of data law as a field to which we want to contribute um, the global perspective. In the next step, um, I want to lead you through three main approaches to what one could call projecting some vision of how data should be governed, how data should be ordered that the European Union, the United States, and the People's Republic of China are currently engaged in. And the starting point is the realization that because of the features of the global digital economy that Benedict highlighted, there is a certain mismatch between the capacity of a state to regulate data just in its territory, which is a key driver for attempts by states to impose data localization requirements, which established a uh, territorial hook to regulate data for privacy reasons, but also for competition law reasons in form of um, potential mandatory data sharing requirements. Because of this mismatch, both between the categorizations within law and the legal categorizations and data science categorizations on the one hand, and the mismatch between nation state based regulation and the global governance um, of this field and the global operations for multinational corporations that are driving much of the technological, but also increasingly the legal development, um, creates this moment where we think it's, it's time to put it together. And it's interesting to compare and contrast how the European Union, the US, and China have responded to this uh, challenge. So in the session this afternoon, Paul Schwartz uh, will elaborate more on that. But it's remarkable that the European Union relying on its uh, sizable market, even though the internal digital single market is far from completed, was able to exercise some kind of first mover advantage to become the focal point for privacy regulation around the world, even in the United States, with the remarkable uh, hearings in the US Congress in which leaders from the Silicon Valley were asked 
whether they were willing to grant GDPR type rights to US citizens. And the way the EU exercises this power um, relies in part on decisions by multinational corporations to adopt the standards and rules that the EU sets in, in, internally for economic reasons. And Arnold Bradford up at Columbia has coined the term Brussels effect for this phenomenon. But the GDPR is also famous for extending explicitly and openly the scope of, it, of its application. And um, but by not necessarily requiring a physical presence within the European Union, but by letting, offering services to citizens in the European Union or by monitoring their behavior online suffice to apply European Union law. And, in, and, and this question, of course, is interesting from an international law perspective where there's a long established but maybe not that fruitful discourse about the international law limits to extraterritorial regulation. And thirdly, the EU um, already in its initial data protection directive invented this system of adequacy requirements that depending on your viewpoint serve as nudges or outright coercion to adopt EU privacy law standards to benefit from unrestricted free data flows between the EU and um, the rest of the world. For, for me as a European, all these approaches are very familiar and they, they rely to a remarkable uh, extent to different, uh, on different legal technologies. In contrast, the United States during the Obama administration uh, championed an effort both in the World Trade Organization but most, um, most remarkably in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations to recraft rules for the digital economy. The Office of the United States Trade Representative put out a document uh, called the Digital to Dozen that, that served as the leaflet to hand out to everyone uh, who wanted to hear it that this was the pioneering effort to push trade law into the 21st century mm -hmm. and to uh, create a state-of-the-art trade agreement. But what that means is that the thinking behind trade law, the basic concepts that we are familiar with um, in international economic law, such as mo most favored nation treatments and basic principles of non-discrimination, are suddenly being applied to, di to digital products. It also means that what internet governance um, enthusiasts and Ev everyday netizens experience as unrestricted free data flows is suddenly reconceptualized as the transnational exchange of information. So di free data flows become di digital trade. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement has a wide range of provisions addressing <coughs> particular concerns um, of digital economy companies in, in this space. Most notably, it is the first agreement that has a binding obligation on states not to restrict free data flows unless they have a very good reason for that and can justify a basic necessity test. In a similar way, it, it restricts states' ability um, to impose data localization requirements. And again, to impose such requirements, states would need a very good reason and would need to jump over the hurdles of a necessity test. And the economic merits and policy merits of these rules can be debated. But what's interesting is the trade framing um, that pushes very much in the direction of what one could call the Silicon Valley consensus. So the idea that if you want to champion the digital economy, you need free data flows and uh, championed by, by strong cloud computing providers and not follow the European model uh, of relatively ro robust um, public law imposed privacy regulation. And the EU had a hard time responding to the proliferation of proposals like the data flow proposals in TPP because it realized uh, the, the potential problems it might create for its own privacy policies. But the interesting question that now popped up in, in Canada is whether there's not just a privacy problem, but a problem with data regulation more generally once states have agreed to agreements that are uh, notoriously hard um, to change. Nevertheless, as most of you here will know, despite the fact that the United States withdrew from the TPP during President Trump's first week in office, the remaining 11 countries that you see on the slide 
chose to endorse the TPP agreement without making any changes to the key provisions of the Electronic Commerce and Digital Trade Chapter. But what might be even more remarkable is that the Trump administration did not break with this Obama policy. So in the, rate, in the recent, uh, recently um, celebrated a new NAFTA agreement, United States, Canada, uh, United States, Mexico, Canada free uh, trade agreement, USMCA, one finds similar language to the one that was used in the TPP agreement. But there are two interesting innovations that point into the direction into which international data law could evolve. One is that unlike TPP, the USMCA has a provision that states what a good data governance policy, what a good data protection law should look like in terms of which elements it should have. Because the TPP had been criticized for just requiring to have a data protection law in name only. Now, it's not clear that just listing concepts that need to show up in a data protection law is good enough to actually raise the level of protection, but I think it's an, evaluate, an, an evolutive step in the development of international data law in a traditional instrument of international public law. And the second element is that, uh, interestingly, interestingly uh, the USMCA decided to further restrict the ability of states to impose data localization requirements. And rethinking how data localization works and what kind of requirement and, and, and how it can be used to further the data policy put objectives in the public interest is, is, is a key debate um, that is currently already unfolding in Canada and that will spread over into other countries. Interestingly, the hype around data, and in particular big data, hasn't fully reached the realm of international investment law yet. International investment law consists of hundreds of bilateral investment treaty with varying importance and relevance, and the investment chapters in international trade agreements. But because these chapters protect investment and assets and property and certain types of property, they raise exactly the questions that the panel this afternoon will address. If data is protected as property or as an asset or is held by a corporation, a regulation that affects these assets, investments and corporations might run into difficulties under international investment law and might be challenged by investor state dispute settlement. And we expect that this is likely to happen. And then arbitral tribunals, such as those organized by the Permanent Court of Arbitration, will have to rule about the, international, about the compatibility of the international investment law framework and domestic data regulation. So that was the trade and investment law um, discourse uh, that was very much driven by the United States and um, that hasn't picked up as much in the World Trade Organization. And finally, it's interesting to look at China, which participates in World Trade Organization and is uh, active in the discourse, but advances a different model that emphasizes less free data flows and, and the benefits of cloud computing and more, more, to, uh, more traditional electronic commerce in which an online platform is used to sell goods and services to the point that the recent proposal that China made is known as the Alibaba proposal, whereas one could call the US proposal the Microsoft or Google proposal. What China is doing at the same time is captured in, in this map, and um, this connects to the initiative that Bendik mentioned that we are pursuing in the ILJ, studying infrastructure as regulation, where one idea is to compare treaty-based international economic ordering with investment and finance-based economic ordering, um, such as uh, China is pursu pursuing, mainly looking westwards uh, towards Europe, but increasingly also in Latin America. So what does that have to do with data? It connects to the interesting question how the ICT revolution is central to the operation of decentralized modes of economic production. But it also relates to questions about baking in standards into technologies. And with the deployment of 5G as the coming standard for transnational mobile data transfers, um, the question is, uh, is hotly debated in various international standard setting organizations 
whether a Chinese standard for the first time in this highly advanced technological field will become the dominant one and what that means for global economic ordering and uh, outside protection of data governance and data protection policies. I won't run fully through the global data infrastructures regulation ideas which, which follow a, a, a similar track. Um, the global digital economy that Benedict was talking about relies on various elements of physical, informational and digital infrastructure that uh, connect in interesting ways to the absence of international law. So, in, as in the case of, of protocols that were initially developed by the, by the IETF that tries to stay as far away from legal categories as humanly possible. And uh, unique identifiers that make free data flows possible um, that is being administered by, the, by ICANN, the organization that convinced me that global administrative law was actually a useful approach to study um, uh, global governance. Um, and the map in the back uh, highlights how global data flows are, are rerouted through backbone infrastructure and internet exchange points. And what is interesting there is the legal arrangements between different network providers and the non-legal arrangements in which pure peering is just uh, connecting networks without further um, exchange um, of co or consideration. Um, this slide shows the C cables that make most of the transnational data transfers uh, possible, but what is commonly not realized is that, there's, uh, a re uh, that this is a case where the uh, international law of the sea has relevance for the uh, deployment and building of sea cables as a key physical infrastructure that at some point needs to come on land. And the next uh, evolution in this space and uh, and a competition uh, is emerging between alternative ways of creating a global uh, data infrastructure. So with that, I want uh, to end and I look forward with you to an exciting day here at NYU Law School and we'll hand over to the next panel um, um, led by Lisa Austin's paper on safe sharing sites that we can also think of as an as a, as a important idea how to develop an infrastructure for data sharing. Thank you. <laughs>